In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Spraz to come. We celebrate today the descent of the Holy Spirit, and I want to keep my remarks kind of short today because we still have the Vesperal service at the very end. But needless to say, when we speak of the grace of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that had never happened before, the Holy Spirit had rested upon the prophets in the Old Testament, and obviously his power had been made known, but the Holy Spirit had never indwelt in a human person. And this is what is unique about the incarnation of Christ, is that he brings with him the fact that because the mother of God bore within herself God, and he being very God and very man, he opened the door for all of human flesh so that people could receive into themselves the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so it is that we speak about the grace that passing on of the Holy Spirit that happens at a purpose person's baptism. And so we want to make a couple preliminary remarks lest we get confused. Number one, everyone receives the same quantity of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to flesh this out. Now, when you come to Holy Communion, if you're a baby and you have a very, very small particle of the body of Christ, very small particle of the body of Christ, how much of Christ have you consumed? all of Christ. If you're the priest in the altar and you have a large piece of the body of Christ and you drink the blood from the chalice, how much of Christ have you consumed? All of Christ, right? There's no quantity in God. And so it is with the Holy Spirit that when someone receives the Holy Spirit, everyone at their their baptism has the possibility of becoming a saint. In fact, the Holy Father's say that Father St. Diodokos of Fotiki, he says that at baptism, the Holy Spirit kind of hides within us. Because most of the time people are baptized or baptized as children. But he says the Holy Spirit kind of hides within us to wait and to see if we will align our life and our will with the will of God. God wants to see, are we going to use our energies to align ourselves with him and become one and become unified, right? Everyone becomes in the model of Christ. That's why we always say Christ is the firstborn among the brethren. He is the new Adam. He is the first. He is the first because he's fully God and fully man. Now we do not partake in that fully God in the fact that we do not in, we do not experience the essence of God, but we experience what the Holy Fathers call these divine energies from the Holy Spirit. It's him dwelling within us and we can feel and sense him. And so in this sense, there's both kind of, you could say a tension or maybe even a conundrum that within us, we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And yet in experience, we experience different quantities or we should say different manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Some people experience a lot of grace. The Holy Spirit is very active. I don't know if you, you know, I sometimes tell stories of holy people that I met, uh, you know, and you can just tell when you interact with them that they are experiencing a lot of what we would say grace, meaning a lot of the Holy Spirit. It comes out in the things that they say, sometimes even things that they say that are unprovoked. I remember one of, one of my favorite or funniest stories was I was speaking with my spiritual mother, Mother Victoria, and she was telling me about her spiritual father, uh, Archimandrite uh, Dimitri, who was uh, from, I believe it was, he was from, um, oh, he, he was, uh, it was from Russia. He was from one of the main monasteries in Russia, and he had escaped during communism, and he ended up in California of all places. And this is where she met him. And he spoke no English, but she was from a Ukrainian family, and so they were able to communicate and whatnot. And I said to her, what was it like with Father Dimitri? And she says, oh, well, for one thing, he knew your thoughts, which was quite concerning. That's what she said. And so it is that people oftentimes interact with these with these clairvoyant elders or holy people, and they have, they have more of the grace. And so it is that even when we think about St. Seraphim of Sarov and his famous words, what is the purpose of the Christian life? The whole purpose of the Christian life is this acquisition of the Holy Spirit. So it's not that we don't have the Holy Spirit, it's rather that we have the Holy Spirit, but that we experience him very little. In fact, St. Simeon, the new theologian, 
in his day, people used to say to him, well, we have the Holy Spirit, we just don't really feel him. And St. Simeon said, basically, it's an impossibility. He, he, he basically said, you're an imposter. You're not a real Christian. Because every real Christian experiences and knows the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They experience him. It's an impossibility to have him and not experience him. This is, this is a very powerful word if we think about it. And so it is, I want to talk about four ways in which the Holy Fathers tell us that we gain the Holy Spirit or that we show the Holy Spirit that we are worthy of his help, his manifestation, his power in our life. Number one, because this is the foremost of all the virtues and it, it tops everything else. What is it? Number one. Anybody? No. Charity. No. Nope. What's, what's greater than prayer? St. Seraphim said this. What's greater than prayer? Obedience. Obedience, Obedience is life. Disobedience is death, as St. Papa Ephraim of Katanakia used to say. Obedience. This is because our, all you could say, our passions and our inclinations hinge on our self-love. This is the main problem that everyone deals with and struggles with is self-love. And so it is that obedience drives out self-love because we are literally forcing ourselves to do something that somebody else wants us to do. Now, how do we see obedience in our lives? Well, it's very simple. Children are obedient to their parents, right? Wives are obedient to their husbands. Husbands are obedient to their spiritual fathers and to the church and to their priest. The priest is obedient to the bishop. The bishop is obedient to the patriarch. But all of these, within every level of obedience, what happens? We are not doing obedience to the person. That's, that would be a cult, right? We are doing obedience to God. A child is being obedient to their parent because their parent is standing in the place of God in their life. Right? This is precisely why the parent is able to say and tell things to the child. It's not because the, the parent is infallible. People are not infallible. Nobody is infallible. Right? It is that God has placed the parent in this position of cultivation. And the same thing happens, you could say, in a marriage in this way. Husbands and wives, as St. Paul says, submit to each other. They listen to each other. They heed what each other has to say. There is a mutual submission. Now, ultimately, the husband is the head of the family. And maybe, maybe once a year, maybe once every even couple years, he may have to say something and say, listen, we can't afford this or we can't do this. You know, maybe occasionally he has to say something. But really, you could say 98% of married life is that mutual submission in obedience to each other and listening to each other. You know, when, when my, I, I have to think, like, when, you're, when your spouse is speaking, you should always try to hear, like, it, when they're speaking, I don't know how to describe this in practical terms, but you should always try to listen to see if they're speaking from the Holy Spirit. Because many times the spouse will actually be speaking the words of God to you. There's a, there's a great saying by St. Sophroni where he says, Make your priest a prophet. He goes, so often people fail when they come to confession because they come to confession with the wrong attitude. He said, if you pray and prepare yourself to come to holy confession and you place your hope in God, not the priest, you place your hope in God, he says, God will speak directly through the priest to you. In fact, it's interesting because that was actually the words of St. Seraphim of Sarav, which St. Seraphim said, it was the people that made him an elder. He said, because the people came to receive an answer from him, God would give him answers, not because he was worthy of it or because he was some great saint. He didn't see himself like this. He saw himself as being, in a sense, you know, a simple monk, a priest. But he said, people came with faith and so God answered them. And the same thing is true in married life. And I can't emphasize that enough, which is when the spouse is speaking, we should always be listening. What is God trying to tell me here? What should I be hearing? What do I need to hear? What do I need to process? That's number one, obedience. Number one. Number two, prayer, fasting, weeping, all of the things that go along with feeling penitential. 
Now, I was mentioning this to someone the other day. They were saying, you know, there's two paths, right? Somebody says, I'm struggling with judgmentalness. I see people, I have judgmental thoughts about them, I condemn them, da 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 da, right? So there's two paths. The number one path is you think, okay, I'm gonna not have judgmental thoughts. And it's like, okay, well, tell me how that works out. You know, like, I'm gonna just not, I'm not gonna judge people. It's very, very hard to not judge people. It's borderline impossible. So you say, I'm not gonna have judgmental thoughts. It's like, okay, well, good luck with that, and we'll see how that works. What the fathers tell us to do is to cultivate the Holy Spirit in repentance. They say that when we, so you, let's, we'll put an example. It's, you do your morning prayers, but you don't just say your morning prayers. You say your morning prayers from your heart and you sorrow over your sins and you see your pride and your egotism. And then you leave the house, you go to work and someone does something. It is almost impossible to have a judgmental thought because you've spent all your time looking at your own sins. And then you see what other people do and immediately you go, who am I to judge them? Why? Because the fathers tell us when we judge ourselves, we stop judging other people. The cure is always to go to God in prayer and in sorrow and in and in the spirit of humility, that takes away our judgment about other people. That's the way that we're actually cured of it. So those are the things, prayer, fasting, weeping, sorrow, contrition, going to confession, all of these things that humble us down and cure the passions. Number three, serving other people. Serving other people. What did our Lord Jesus Christ say? Like one of the most... I think one of the most powerful of all the verses in the New Testament, he says, I came to serve, not to be. He's the creator of the universe. If anybody is worthy of our service, what does a king do? A king says, you do this, right? A king is all about what? Delegating. A king doesn't go out and fight the battles. They don't prepare the food. They don't do this. They don't do that, right? They're not... They're not, you know, you could say maybe they're servant leaders in the best possible case, but most of the time they're just rulers. They're just rulers. They're, in, they're, they're, they're affecting their will upon the people around them. That is not what Christ did. Christ said, I came to serve, not to be served. If somebody wants to find the grace of the Holy Spirit, they find it in serving other people. They find it in taking care of the people around them particularly for those of us who live in the world. People in a monastery do, monks in a monastery and nuns do some service, but it's really pe people and especially parents that do the bulk of the service work. And we should always get a sense that we are serving unto God and that we are doing it with a good attitude. The attitude is key and we'll get to this in a minute, but the attitude with which we serve other people why do I make money? Why do I make money? So I can buy nice things, of course. Everybody should know this. No, that's not why I make money. I, I make money so I can take care and serve other people around me. That's the purpose of money. The money is not for me. The money is for other people. What about my time? You know, it's like, what's the purpose of my time? I may allocate some time to my own hobbies or my own things that I like, but the purpose of my time is to utilize it to make other people's lives better, more fulfilled, more wonderful. That's the goal of utilizing the things that I have at my disposal for other people around me. You know, that's the insanity. When people make a bunch of money, they think I've got to keep acquiring more money. I can't remember who it was. It was, it was I think it was Rockefeller or somebody. And they said, how much is enough money? And he said, one more dollar. You know, it was like it was always one more. Why? Because it was an insanity. He had gone crazy. He had gone crazy. It was all about himself. And you, it gets to the point with some people where they, they have so much money, they can't even spend it all, but they want more of it. It's a, it's a mental illness. In the true sense, it's a true mental illness. Whereas you may meet somebody who has next to nothing and they share with you. Right? You ever go somewhere where people are poor and you share a meal with somebody and it's like, the grace is there. There's love. There's love. There's fellowship. There's self-sacrifice. It's very, very rich and powerful. Number four, seeing with faith, keeping the eyes of faith. 
There's a beautiful story from St. Paisios where he says something along the lines of there's a husband and he's praying for humility or whatever. And he comes home and then his wife starts to nag him and he like blows up on her. And he goes, he was praying for humility and God was giving him the opportunity to be humble. And immediately he like threw that away, right? What do we do when we see things with faith? The number one dilemma, or I should say one of the top dilemma of people in the West is they constantly think that they have to change their life in order to acquire happiness. So I've got to get a better spouse. I got to get a better car. I got to get better kids. I got to get a better job. I got to get a better this. I got to, we, you know, if we paint the house, if we pressure wash the driveway, if we remodel the bathroom, then I'll be happy. And it's always externals because the internal is empty. They, people don't see with the eyes of faith. They don't, they don't understand that the circumstances and the situations in their life are such. They, they are that way because this is God's means by which he's cultivating them. You know, I was thinking about this the other day when I actually was talking with Father Nectarios, the keeper of the Viran icon a while back. And I was, and we were talking about, you know, it's like, who sent Father Moses to Austin? Somebody's going to be like Archbishop Peter, but the actual, but the fathers say what? They say the bishop opens his mouth and the Holy Spirit speaks. And it was interesting because I was talking with Deacon Nectarios and I said, why did this, this, and this? And he said, because the mother of God wanted that church. That was it. When we see with the eyes of faith, we begin to see that there are things happening and that the things in our life are actually just fine. They're perfect for the cultivation of our soul and for our repentance and for bringing about the spiritual change that we have and that we need. And so it is, I'll touch briefly on four last points. How do we lose the Holy Spirit? How do we lose the Holy Spirit? Number one, disobedience. Disobedience, if the way to gain it is obedience, the number one way to lose the Holy Spirit is through disobedience. This is why you could say something like keeping the fast on Wednesdays and Fridays is so important for communing on Sunday. Why? Because it shows the disposition of your heart. It's not about the food. It's not like you, you drink a cup of, you put a cup of uh, half and half in your coffee on Friday and like magically you're unclean. We're not Judaizers. That's not, that's not our faith, right? You're not unclean because you broke the fast. What it is, is it shows the state of the heart. I want to do my own will. I want to do what I want to do. And that's the other thing that I find so often. This is a perfect example, which is people will be tormented by something in confession, which is rather minor or something, whatever, but they'll ignore the greater sins of actually harming or hurting people around them. It's like, some may be like, oh, I'm upset because I'm gaining weight and I'm being gluttonous. But meanwhile, the real problem in their life is that they're disobedient in all these different ways that are actually more serious. And so it is the number one way we lose the grace of the Holy Spirit is through disobedience. Number two, negligence. So if prayer, fasting, weeping, coming to services, coming to vigil, coming to confession, receiving Holy Communion, put us in the right spiritual framework then what happens if we are skipping or not doing those things? We are losing grace. I tell this all the time, like you cannot be in a good spiritual place if you don't come to Holy Communion regularly. It's an impossibility. It's not possible. It's not possible. You know, when you, when you do Holy Communion once every couple months, and you're not coming to vigils and not coming to feast days and skipping these things and this and this and that. It's an impossibility to be in a good spiritual place. Number three, if serving others brings grace, selfishness. Selfishness loses grace. Taking care of myself. This is often one of the number one things that you run in with to people with is, is the fact that people often, they want to take care of themselves. They don't want God to take care of them. They want to do their own will. And pride is the penultimate of this. Disobedience, negligence, selfishness, this all results and comes out of pride. And what is, what is the purpose of my life? Serving and bettering my own life. It's not bettering other people's lives. This is, this is a person who has little or no grace in their life. And lastly, heresy. 
which may have caught you by surprise, but there are a couple of major heresies in our modern day church that have to be addressed. Number one, the lack of morality. There is a tendency to lower the standards of moral living in our Orthodox Church today, whereby people think it's normal to live together before marriage, to act in all kinds of inappropriate ways, that they even go on to bless the things that are happening in our society and culture, and they ignore the moral tradition of the church. Even worse, they begin to say, well, that person is good. They were a good person, and so they are going to heaven, even despite the fact that they in no way, shape, or form actually had much or of any relationship with God. Now, the next heresy is ethnophilatism. This is another one in our society here in North America. This has been condemned, which was the separation of ethnic groups or the pairing of orthodoxy with ethnic groups or making, you could say, churches more ethnic. This is why when you start to separate the church from the culture and from the mission of actually reaching the people, it becomes a little ethnic ghetto. You know, it's like the person who is in the, in the Greek church and says, I want to become a priest. And somebody's like, how can you become a priest? You're not Greek. Or somebody comes to the Russian church and they say, why are you here? Right? Why are you here? Jim and I talked about this before. Why are you here? You're not Russian. This is not the right place for you. That is ethnophilitism. Or we will do the services in a language that the people cannot understand. We will not reach out to the community. We will not bring people in. We will not share the gospel. We will make our little group based around our ethnicity. This is the center of our religious life is our ethnicity and the language and the, and the country that we miss and the language that we speak. It's not Jesus Christ. This happens a lot here in North America, but it's interesting because it's, it's actually so many of those churches are now gone and so many of them are on their way out that it's, it's, it's curious to see that whole sections of the Northeast, uh, Northeastern part of America where this was extremely prevalent because they failed to convert people, a lot of those churches are empty and they're dying and they don't know what to do with them. They're dead. There's like, I went to a church one time you could have fit 400 people in there easily, comfortably. Beautiful icons, some of the best icons I've seen in North America. They had, uh, it was um, tiles along the border of the wall, like a chair rail, but they were like granite squares that were like four by four. Uh, they were gorgeous, like just an absolutely gorgeous church. I went there for uh, Vespers uh, and it was the priest, his wife, myself, and one person. Nobody was there. Church was completely dead. They had nothing. Why? Because it was about the culture. It was about the ethnicity. It wasn't about Jesus Christ. It wasn't about sharing the gospel. It wasn't about proclaiming the gospel and bringing people into the church and into the life of Christ and baptizing them into Christ as we talked about today. Brothers and sisters, these are the ways that we both acquire grace and we lose grace, may we constantly be remembering these things and looking at the things that we're doing in our life and asking ourselves the question, what am I doing with my life and my time and my energy? Am I acquiring grace or am I losing grace? Is what I'm doing each and every day of the week when I set my hand to a task, am I doing something that's bringing grace and salvation to other people? Or am I doing something that's causing me to be estranged from God so much that I don't even feel his presence or know that he's there or that my prayers are dry or hollow or repetitive and I don't have that sense of the Holy Spirit? May we all find this deeper repentance in our life and in the things that we are doing. Amen.